So our presentation today is about a very prolific author who died in September in 1890, John Shelby Spong. Before we get into that, three days here, and I have to say about 30 seconds or 60 seconds. Here, about <laughs> I'm timing you. <laughs> I'm going to take. At least, at least 30 seconds, probably a minute. So um, it's going to be on the Trinity. So the question is, how if, if the central tenet of Judaism is the Shema, hero Israel, the Lord is one God. So how do you go from one God to three in a system that is dedicated to monotheism? Traditional Judaism, one God plus one son equals two gods, small g, equals blasphemy. Right. So how do you get one God plus one son equals one God equals faithful witness? How did we get there? And what does it mean? So that's what we'll explore next week. And we'll get into some of the uh, current things about the Trinity that are interesting to people, at least to me. So okay. I think you'll like it. Sounds good. And this is an issue. Trinity is an issue that totally life. And that's why I asked BJ to make the presentation of Trinity. Thank you. I wanted to hear what you say about it and how it made, make it tie it together. It makes sense out of it, which I did. Thank you so much. Good. All right. So, um, Jim, for some reason, you are not coming across clear, but BJ came across very clear. Well, uh, 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 yeah, uh, no competition uh, here uh, because he has a mask on. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's a mask. <laughs> All right. So, Sheila, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right. That long pause there made me wonder. No, All I right. was unmuting uh, myself. <laughs> okay. So, um, our topic today is a pro pro prolific author, um, John Shelby Spong, Episcopalian. I grew up in the Episcopalian church. It was called Anglican. Um, what I knew, it was quite conservative. Um, Spong is not. Um, uh, again, a prolific author, uh, well respected. And, and today he takes issue with certain Christian practices, uh, as we'll find out. So without further ado, let's get into it. And we'll have, we'll have time for discussion afterwards, and I believe we'll need it. PJ won't be here at that time, but I actually probably will. Oh, I'll, I'll help facilitate the discussion. Good, good, good. Thank you. The title of this book is a title that Harper gave it The Sins of Scripture. It's the juxtaposing of two words that don't normally get spoken together. Actually, they didn't like my original title. My title for it was The Terrible Text of the Bible. <laughs> and they said, we live in such a secular age that people don't know what a text is, so you can't use that. <laughs> and so, as usual, I acquiesced in Harper's title. But I also wanted it to show how Christianity has moved from a tribal religion into what I hope can be a universal faith. What I tried to do in this book was to expose not just the dark chapters of Christian history, but the scriptural basis for those dark chapters. Because we Christians have believed that we had the only true faith, we have systematically persecuted other religions throughout our lifetime, throughout our history. You have to go back to the 10th and 11th and 12th centuries to see where armies of European Christians put together by the Vatican and the Pope invaded the Middle East and slaughtered thousands of Muslims. And we did it because we regarded them as having an inadequate faith, even a demonized faith. In 2001, Muslim fanatics, 
deciding that they had the only true faith, attacked the Western world on 9-11 because we were the demon people in their mentality. There's not much difference. Whenever any religious group decides <clears throat> what happened? I'm presuming it happened on their end too. in the United States with a minister named Timothy Dwight. He was probably the best known spokesman in the United States for religion in the public arena. And it was in that very period of history that medical science was finally developing something called vaccinations. And Timothy Dwight, in the name of his understanding of Christianity, railed against vaccinations. His argument? If God had intended from all eternity that you would die of diphtheria, a vaccination will thwart the will of God. That was a serious argument. Now, we quote the Bible to say you cannot remove a feeding tube placed into the stomach of a woman who's been brain dead for 15 years without being anti-religious. It's interesting how the debate changes. I was looking for the... That's... During Christian history, we have persecuted gay and lesbian people so frequently that the very nickname by which we slander gay and lesbian people when we call them faggots, that nickname comes from the little stick that was used to ignite the fires that burned the homosexuals at the stake in Christian history. And we burned so many of them that the little lighted stick became a synonym for the victim. I wonder if anybody in the Christian tradition is proud of that heritage. But just a few years ago, when a young gay man named Matthew Shepard, a Wyoming University student, was set upon by a gang of older men and beaten until unconscious and left on a fence post in rural Wyoming in sub-freezing weather until he died, when that young man was being buried, a Baptist preacher from Topeka, Kansas, picketed the funeral service with a sign that said, God said fags should die, Leviticus 20. We have taken texts out of the Bible and we have used them to do incredible evil to a very significant number of people. And look at what we've done to women. Sometimes the newest generation of women who are able to do such remarkable things forget what the past was. Women could not vote in the United States until 1920. I think it was about the same time that women in Canada, maybe you were ahead of us, you usually are. 1920, women couldn't be on the, in the cabinet of our president until 1932. No woman served on the Supreme Court until Ronald Reagan appointed Sandra Day O'Connor in the 1980s. Women did not, were not allowed to go to universities until the turn of the century. Women entered the job force in the Western world as a source of cheap labor. They became teachers because teaching didn't pay men well enough to get enough men into the teaching profession. And so it was turned over to women who could be hired cheaply. Doctors didn't like to do bedpans, and so the nursing profession entered into the world to do the scut labor of medical science. The profession's grown, I must say, a great deal from that time, but that's where it started. And then women became secretaries so that the lordly males could be freed from menial duties, and that's the way women entered the workforce. And all the time, the Bible was quoted 
to justify second-class citizenship for women. The quotations are easy to cite. In the United States, in 1874, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that a woman who had passed every external standard to practice law in the state of Illinois, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled by an eight to one majority that she could not practice law because, quote, God has created the woman for the more domestic role. To my knowledge, that case has never been officially overturned, but it's sort of visually inoperative with two women sitting on the Supreme Court. All the way through history, we see chapters where people have been hurt, diminished, violated, killed, and that activity has been justified by quoting Holy Scripture. Look at what we've done to the Jews. I don't have time to go through the whole history, but let me just mention we're familiar with the Holocaust which occurred in a Western Christian nation, at least ostensibly Christian. And the United States and Canada and Great Britain did little or nothing, even when they knew that Jews were being exterminated. And Pope Pius XII, at worst, was a collaborator, at best, was a benign neglect observer. But even before the Holocaust, in the 14th century, the great bubonic plague swept across Western Europe, killing somewhere between a fifth and a third of the adult population. And they didn't know about germs, viruses, rat infestation, and so they interpreted the plague as if it is divine wrath being expressed. And so they raised the question, what have we done to cause this incredible outpouring of God's wrath upon the people of Europe? And they came to the conclusion that what they had done was that they had tolerated infidels in Christian Europe. And so as a response to the bubonic plague, the worst persecution of Jewish people, who were the only infidels they could find, the worst persecution of Jewish people until Adolf Hitler topped it, took place in Christian Europe. And every time they did this, they quoted the Bible, his blood be upon us and upon our children, to justify their heinous behavior. What I've tried to do is to take the terrible text of the Bible that had been used to hurt, to destroy, to diminish, and expose them and face them, and call on the Christian church to face its own history, and to recognize that Christianity was supposed to be far more than that. But tonight, I don't, I don't want to develop any of those. I want to develop one that I have not developed in this public lecture circuit before, and part of that is because I'm getting tired of my own stump speech. <laughs> and part of that is that a lot of people in this audience have already heard me before, so I don't want you to have to do it again. So I want to turn to another passage in Scripture and try to develop a very interesting way that I think it has impacted our understanding of the Christian faith. Have you ever heard the book of Proverbs quoted? That, you are, that if you spare the rod, you will spoil the child. That's been used by many a parent, including my own mother, on more than one occasion with a very interesting definition of what it means to be human lying behind that. And if you examine the history of the Christian faith, you will discover that something that comes very close to sadomasochism has taken place inside this Christian institution. Schoolmasters throughout Western history have been well known as punishing schoolmasters who beat their students. And you need to recognize that almost all of the schools in Western civilization until very recently were church-related schools, and they were mostly taught by church people. And punishing children physically was an activity encouraged, supported by church authority. 
Now, it, it's interesting that today every psychiatrist I know thinks that corporal punishment is bad for children. But the church had its own standards. And the church has ripped deep into its life that the punishment, the physical punishment of children is necessary because of the church's definition of what a child is. So we have to go back and begin to look at that. And when we do, we find surprisingly, and two of them were the Tigris and the Euphrates, which means the Garden of Eden was in the middle of Iraq. It's kind of an interesting note in today's world. And God and human life were intimately connected. Human beings were created in God's image. They lived in a perfect relationship with God, and they served as God's stewards over God's world. But then the biblical story says that human life corrupted God's world in an act of disobedience, and human beings fell into sin. We call that the original sin. It corrupted the whole creation. And now human beings were separated from God, and there was this relationship of antagonism. And these fallen creatures had no way that they could overcome their own self-destruction. And God could no longer walk in the cool of the evening because God was now their judge, not their friend. And nobody is happy walking around with their judge. And this man and this woman were banished from the garden, says this ancient story. And they were told they could never come back into that perfect world again. They had to live east of Eden, to borrow a phrase from John Steinbeck. And the whole biblical story is written against that understanding of human life. Human life is fallen. Human life is sinful. Human life is distorted. Human beings cannot save themselves. Even in our liturgy, we say things like, we can do nothing good without you. It's an interesting definition of human life. And so the drama in the Bible is the drama of God trying to reach out to this broken, fallen creation in order to restore it to what God had originally intended the creation to be. And none of the ways that God tries to reach out to these broken, fallen, distorted creatures, none of them seem successful. God sends the law but the people are incapable of keeping the law. God sends the prophets, but the people kill the prophets. If you're in the insurance business, you don't ever want to insure a prophet. <laughs> that just is not a good actuary or risk. And finally, the story says that in the fullness of time, God had to come into this world God's self and bring about the redemption. And it was a costly act because the only way God could do it was to allow the divine Son to be crucified. Now that's what I call the woodshed theory of the atonement. But those of you who weren't raised in the southern part of the United States might not know what happened in the woodshed. But that's where your parents would take you to beat you for your sinfulness, for your misconduct. A trip to the woodshed was dreaded the woodshed theory of the atonement says that human beings are evil. We've been bad boys and girls. We deserve to be punished. And God, the heavenly sheriff, takes us out to the heavenly woodshed, and God gets ready to beat us for our sins, and at the last moment, Jesus steps in. You have to say that with three syllables to be understood. <laughs> You've got to say, Jesus stepped in. <laughs> and God beats Jesus instead of you and instead of me. And on that frame of reference, we have told the Jesus story through the ages. Now think about that story. What kind of God is that? What kind of God is it who cannot reach out to broken, sinful people and say, I love you just as you are. I forgive you. Please come back and dwell in a relationship with me. No, this God says, I can't forgive you until I have had a human sacrifice and a blood offering offered to me. 
until I've made the divine son the victim so that my sense of righteousness is satisfied. Is that a God you really want to worship? And how often the whole Jesus story has been wrapped around those images. And what does that do? Have you ever heard anybody say, Jesus died for your sins? You can hardly turn on the radio for these religious programs if you don't hear that five or six times in the first five minutes. Jesus died for your sins? What kind of message is that? That's a guilt message. You are so wretchedly evil that the Christ figure had to suffer for your sins. Man, that's a guilt trip. You are responsible for the death of Jesus? And God? God becomes a person guilty of divine child abuse. Is that good news? Now look what we do in church on Sunday mornings. You can hardly go to any church in the great multiplicity of types of churches in the world. You can hardly go to any of them without having your humanity insulted every Sunday. You gather together in church, and what do we have you saying? Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. What kind of cry is that? To what kind of God is that? And we say of ourselves, we are not worthy even to gather up the crumbs under the divine table. There is no health in us. We've done the things we ought not to have done. We've not done the things we ought to have done. We are miserable, wretched, incompetent creatures. Have you ever known anybody to be helped by being told how wretched, miserable, and incompetent they are? We seem to know that, but we don't seem to understand it when we come to church. And so the church has gotten deeply involved into what I would call the messages of guilt. Guilt is the great controller of human behavior. If we can make you feel guilty enough, we can keep you under control forever. And so we develop stories about God who has heaven and hell. And if you're a good boy and girl, you might go to heaven. If you're a bad boy and girl, you know exactly where you're going to go and you know exactly what you're going to get. So it's this punishing God. And so the church teaches us that we are like little children cowering before an authority figure who's getting ready to beat us. You spare the rod, you spoil the child. You spare divine punishment, and you get human beings who somehow don't know how to worship. But let me ask you to try that, those of you who are parents. Let me ask you to try that on your children. Remember the time you brought your first child home from the hospital, or the midwife delivered your first child to your arms? And you wanted to be a good parent, so you read books that the church writes about good parenthood. And those books say, every day of that child's life, you tell that child that child was born in sin. You tell that child that that child is one wretched, miserable offender. You tell that child that child's not worthy to gather up the crumbs under the divine table. Do you think you'd raise a healthy adult? Well, do you think psychological abuse under the guise of worship creates healthy adults? What kind of sadomasochism is it that has captured so much of the church's proclamation of its gospel? During the Lenten season, sometimes you think you might be in a sadomasochistic shop when you see the bulletins that churches put out. Those bulletins during Lent frequently have nails and whips. And we don't much think about that. We don't raise that to consciousness. But so much of the Christian story has been told throughout the ages in such a way as to diminish you. In the United States, people say that the most popular hymn in America is Amazing Grace. That may be true in Canada. But why is God's grace amazing in that hymn? Have you listened? It's because that grace saved a wretch like you. You wretched people. Is that good news? Is that life-giving? And how do you square that? 
with the words that Jesus is purported to have said, that I've come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly. What we have done in Christian history is that we have separated God from the world. We have isolated God up in some heavenly realm, which for years we thought of as just above the sky. And so in order for God to get into life in the person of Jesus, a landing field has to be created. And we call that landing field the virgin birth. That's how God gets in. And once God gets into the world, you're not really comfortable having God living quite that intimately with you. So you've got to have a way for God to get out when the work of salvation is done. So you have to create a launching pad. And the story of Jesus' cosmic ascension is the launching pad. So this external God has a way to get into this world, do God-like things, die in order to bring you into God's presence, and then exit the world to be back with God above the sky. And that's the way we've told the Christian story. And we've literalized the entry story and the exit story, and we suddenly discover that they don't quite translate into the 21st century. The entry story doesn't translate because we discovered in 1724 that women have an egg cell. The virgin birth story assumes that the woman is just a vessel that does not contribute anything to the life of Jesus. So all you have to get rid of is the human father because he was the source of the divine life. So you get rid of the human father and replace that with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus' humanity is not corrupted because the Virgin Mary only lends the nurture of her womb. She doesn't contribute. But now we know that she had an egg cell. And that 50% of Jesus' genetic code came from his mother. And she too was a child of, of Adam. So she passed on the fall. Suddenly, our understanding of Jesus is shattered. That's why a hundred years after we discovered the egg cell in a woman, we had to have a new doctrine called the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin so she could get cleaned up of Adam's sin since we now knew she was a contributor to the life of Jesus. Theology has always been able to adapt if you give them enough time. (laughs) And on the other end of the story, the cosmic ascension has become something that's beyond our understanding because that assumes that the way you get to heaven is to rise up in the sky, go through the keyhole, and beyond that, the roof, there is heaven. But what sense does that make in a space age? There's a great American astrophysicist who said to me on one occasion, Do you know if Jesus really ascended into the sky, and if he traveled at the rate, at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, he hasn't yet escaped our galaxy. (laughs) And because this astrophysicist happened to be named Carl Sagan, he went on to say, and our galaxy is only one of billions and billions and billions of galaxies. I thought he was going to have a religious experience. (laughs) He was so carried away. The story doesn't quite make sense. And it is trying to carry a burden that maybe we ought to look at again. In 1859, an English biologist who wanted to study to be an Anglican priest early in his life named Charles Robert Darwin was instead given a slow boat ride to the Galapagos Islands. And history has never quite been the same. And when he published his book, The Origin of Species Through Natural Selection, he suddenly confronted the Christian church, not with a threat to the seven-day literal creation story, that's what the Christians understood the threat to be, but Darwin's threat was to the whole understanding of human life. For Darwin said, There never was a perfect creation. None of us ever started perfect. And if there's no perfect creation, there could not have been a fall. You can't fall unless you once had perfection. 
No, he said, human life has emerged over four and a half billion years from lower forms of life into higher forms, and finally, probably no more than a million or so years ago, into something that we would recognize as human. Now, if Darwin is accurate and the DNA evidence available to us makes us fairly sure that Darwin is accurate, then we can no longer tell the story of the origins of human life as perfection corrupted. Instead, we've got to see human life as emerging. Now, what does that mean? That means we no longer can tell the story of God coming into this world in the person of Jesus to rescue the fallen sinner, to restore the fallen sinner to what God intended that sinner to be. And there are a lot of people that think once you embrace that, that you can no longer tell the Christian story. But maybe there's a different way. Maybe you can tell the story of God's love being so powerfully experienced in the life of one Jesus of Nazareth that it called and empowered us to dare to become more fully human. I don't think I'm looking out tonight on a group of fallen sinners. I think I'm looking out on a group of people who have not yet become fully human. And that's a very different point of view. And so the Christian church is not to rescue fallen sinners, where in order to make them understand the great gift of God, you've got to constantly beat up on them and tell them how wretched and miserable they are. But if you are incomplete human beings, what you need is not something that makes you feel more inadequate and more incomplete. What you need is something that empowers you to become so fully human that you no longer have to build yourself up by tearing somebody else down. Maybe that's the way to tell the Christ story. And maybe we can begin to escape some of the terrible texts of the Bible because those texts are all designed to say, I'm better than you. And if you don't become like me, you will remain in your wretched state. So with that background, let me ask you to look again at the biblical portrait of Jesus. But scrape away from that portrait the layers of interpretive data based upon that previous understanding of human life. And see if it's not possible to look at that Christ figure from a very different perspective. One of the ways that human beings build themselves up by tearing somebody else down is to develop tribal identity. We call it nationalism. We sometimes call it patriotism. It's a way of saying, my nation is God's chosen people. So anybody my nation hates, God must surely hate. And we have that kind of stuff going on all over the world. But Jesus lived in a world where Jews and Gentiles were deeply separated. Jews called Gentiles unclean. Jews would not eat with Gentiles lest they be corrupted. What does Jesus do about that boundary that separates the Jew from the Gentile, the same boundary that sets nations against one another in our world today? Well, go back and read the Jesus story from a different perspective. I find it fascinating that in the second book of the New Testament, the Epistle to the Galatians, written around 51, Paul, caught up in the ecstasy of whatever the Jesus movement was, writes the most astounding thing for the first century. He says, once you're inside the Christ power, there is no Jew or Gentile. There is no Jew or Greek. You're lifted beyond the boundary of your security system into a new humanity. I also find it fascinating that in the first gospel, Mark, Mark tells the story of Jesus complete to the place where he is dead on the cross. And Mark puts a Gentile at the foot of the cross to interpret that death. That's an astonishing thing. It's a Gentile centurion. And the Gentile centurion looks at that Christ life that has given itself away without grasping 
to contain and continue. And the Gentile soldier says, quote, at least this is the way we translate it, truly this man was the son of God. And we've interpreted that to mean that this Gentile had a magnificent insight into creedal theology that didn't develop for another 300 years. <laughs> what this man was saying is that when you see a life so full, so free, so whole, that this life can give itself away totally, that's when you see God present in human history. And then you go to Matthew. Matthew is the first, is the, in the Bible is the first gospel, but it's the most Jewish gospel. It's more closely identified with synagogue life. And yet even Matthew says that when Jesus was born, a star appeared in the sky to announce that birth. What's so unusual about a star? What's unusual is the star doesn't just shine over the land of the Jews. People from all over the world could see that star. And that star drew the world together by drawing the world to this Christ figure. That's what the Magi are all about. They're not three guys who hopped on camels to follow a wandering star. They're Gentiles being drawn to the brightness of God's rising. And they are a way of demonstrating that if you get inside the power of the love of God experienced in Christ Jesus, that the barrier between Jew and Gentile, the tribal boundaries that separate us all from other people, they begin to disappear. Then when Matthew closes his story, he has the risen Christ say only one thing to the disciples. And what is that? He says, you've got to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And we've taken that as sort of a missionary imperative that we've got to go convert the world. But that's not what was meant. Jesus was saying, now that you understand who I am, what my power is, you've got to go beyond the boundaries of your security system. You've got to go beyond your tribal identity. You've got to go out into the world where the Gentiles live. And the gospel you proclaim is that God's love is not bounded by tribal identity. God's love sweeps over all of our man-made or human-made barriers and calls us into a new humanity where there is no division between tribe, between Jew and Gentile. Now, there are lots of other places I could go to illustrate that point, but let me move on. Because another way we deal with our insecurity and our sense of inadequacy is that we develop prejudices. The sole purpose of a prejudice is to make the prejudiced one feel good. I am not like you. And we define people according to our standard. For centuries, people of white skin defined people of non-white skin as non-whites. That's almost a non-person. Prejudice helps build ourselves up. Why do you need to build yourself up? If you need to build yourself up, somebody is always going to be your victim. And you have to convince yourself that you are by God's creation superior to justify treating people as your inferiors. So that's deep in the heart of all of us human beings. And what Jesus seemed to understand is that prejudice not only violates the victim, prejudice violates the prejudiced one. You cannot be human and be prejudiced. You're so busy building yourself up at someone else's expense that your own humanity is impaired in the process. Now go to the Jesus story with that understanding. The most prominent prejudice in the ancient world, in the Jewish world, was the hatred that Jews had for Samaritans. What was a Samaritan? A Samaritan was a half-breed heretic. They were half-breed Jews whose worship had been corrupted by Gentile alien forces that had come in when they had intermarried outside their tribe. And the Jews hated the Samaritans with a particular passion. And Jesus lives in a world where that kind of prejudice tries to make some people secure at some other people's expense. And what does Jesus do with that? 
Well, there are lots of stories, but let me just pick one. There's a parable in Luke that says a certain traveler went out one day from Jerusalem to go to Jericho, and he fell among thieves, and they beat him to within an inch of his life, and they left him a bloody heap and unconscious on the side of the road. And along came a Levite. A Levite is at least one of the governing members of the church's governing body, a vestryman, a lay reader, somebody really in the know, someone in the upper crust of religious importance. And that Levite knew that the first requirement of the law, the law of God, was that you show mercy upon people in need. But in this story, we're told the Levite passed by on the other side. And then along came a priest. Now everybody knows that priests are holier than just ordinary people. And if you don't believe that, we'll tell you. <laughs> Why else do you think we put the name the revered one in front of clergy's names? That's what reverend means. We are the revered one, and we want you to know that. In my church and in the Roman Catholic Church, we've even developed a little habit of putting a cross by your name to make sure that people know that you're holier than thou. And of course, when you get to be a bishop, you get to put the cross in front of your name because everybody knows bishops are far holier than just ordinary priests. That's the law of that's the law of an institution seeking power. Look at how we dress our bishops. We put a royal crown on their heads, and a royal cape on their backs, and a royal ring on their finger, and a signet medal called a pectoral cross around their necks, and we give them a royal staff, and we seat them in a chair called the bishop's throne, and he lives in a house called the bishop's palace. And then we try to convince anybody that we're in the ministry of servanthood. <laughs> now, the symbols don't wash. They just don't wash. So along comes a priest who studied at theological academy who must know that the requirement of the Torah is that you show mercy upon people in need, and everything else is subservient to that. And the priest walks by on the other side. Perhaps the priest also knows that part of the Torah that says, if you touch a dead man, you become unclean. And he knew that his holiness just couldn't stand being unclean, and he didn't know whether this guy was dead or alive. And so he doesn't want to risk it. And then Jesus says, along comes a half-breed heretic, a Samaritan. He wouldn't know the law of God if you put it in his hands and said, this is the Torah. But this half-breed heretic is a human being. And he recognizes another human being in need. And he goes to him, and he cares for him. And afterwards, Jesus says to his disciples, the one who is neighbor and does the act of love that the Torah requires, that person is more deeply the child of Abraham than the Levite or the priest. That wasn't designed to make Jesus very popular. But Jesus knew that prejudice kills not just the victim, but the prejudiced one. And so he says, inside the experience of the love of God, You've got to come to such an acceptance of your humanity that you no longer have to use your humanity to look down upon another human being. And that's a call to a new humanity. And then I haven't got time to develop it, but in the world that Jesus lived in, women were clearly viewed as inferior to men. And so no man would actually engage a woman in conversation. Women were sort of in existence only for breeding purposes. You never had a relationship of significance with a woman. And yet, when you look at the story, Jesus has a conversation with the Samaritan woman by the well. Jesus seems to be a frequent guest in the home of Mary and Martha. On one occasion, he even challenges Mary, Martha, who is critical of Mary, because she's taken the role of a student sitting at the feet of the teacher, something a woman was not allowed to do. And Jesus clearly had female disciples. Church has had a hard time with that, but they're in the book. You can't get rid of them. And they become visible in the Christian story only because all of the male disciples have forsaken him and fled. That's why you see the women in the crucifixion scene and the resurrection scene. The men have all fled. And Jesus is constantly calling 
people to step beyond the gender boundary of trying to prove male superiority by demonstrating female inferiority. And the church in large measure has not learned that lesson yet. When I was a child growing up in my Anglican church, you know what we call the women of the church? We call them the auxiliary. That's revealing, isn't it? The woman's auxiliary. The church was male. Women were the auxiliary to the church. They were sort of like Rotary Anns. They weren't quite members of the Rotary Club. And we've denigrated women in every conceivable way. But you can't be human and look down or judge 50% of the human race to be somehow inferior to you. A new humanity enables you not to have to put somebody else down in order to elevate yourself. And the last thing that Jesus does that I think is astounding, but we somehow never see it because we're so busy arguing about the minutia of literalism, and that is that Jesus recognizes that religion is one of the most divisive forces in human history. And so Jesus is always calling people to step beyond the boundaries of their religion. Jesus lived in a world where his religion said that a leper was unclean, and so Jesus embraces the rotting flesh of the leper. Jesus lived in a world where it was said that a menstruating woman was unclean, and Jesus is portrayed as allowing the touch of the woman with the chronic menstrual leak. And instead of becoming unclean, as the law suggested, the woman became whole in the experience of his love. His religion said that human beings had to adapt their lives to the meaning of the Sabbath. And Jesus said, you've got that all wrong. The Sabbath was made for the enrichment of human life. Human life wasn't made for the enrichment of the Sabbath. Every time he has an opportunity, he steps beyond the boundaries of his religion. His religion said that a woman taken in the act of adultery is to be stoned until dead. And Jesus steps between that woman and her accusers. Religion is one of the security symbols that we human beings have adopted in order to make ourselves feel superior. That's why in our religious traditions we always develop an infallible authority. Because if you don't have an infallible authority, you can't really claim that you have the ultimate truth and anybody that disagrees with you is wrong. And so in the Catholic tradition we have our infallible Pope, and in the Protestant tradition we have our inerrant Bible, and in all religious traditions the claim is made that we and we alone are the true church, we have the true faith. No one comes to the Father except through my religious tradition. What incredible arrogance that human beings can tell God through what means God must draw human beings to God's self. What incredible arrogance. And yet we fight and kill one another on this basis all the time. What I'd like for, to suggest to you is that divinity does not mean the invasion of a power from outside this world. That maybe divinity is in the heart of human life, and if we would just learn to live and love and be, we might discover divinity all around us. Charles Wesley wrote a Christmas hymn that I really cannot stand to sing, called Hark the Herald Angels Sing. You all know it. One of the lines of that hymn says that Jesus was not really human. He was veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. He was masquerading as human. It was God invading human life because human life was so broken, sinful, fallen, and inadequate. Now, I think we've got to turn that around. God is in human life. Some of you remember pell-mell cigarettes. I haven't seen them recently, but when they put a filter on pell-mell, they had an interesting ad. They say, pell-mell filters filter the smoke over, under, around, and through. And that's how I think we've got to begin to think of God. Not as an external supernatural power living in the sky, but as the divine quality of this world that is over us in the sense that it's beyond anything we can imagine. It's under us. 
It's the rock, the ground of being upon which we stand. It's around us and through us, and God lives in us. And maybe the difference between being human and being divine is not the difference between two things. Maybe it's the difference in a spectrum. Maybe the way to become divine is to become so fully human that your life becomes open and the infinite presence of God can flow through you in an unfettered and unbroken way to bring about wholeness in the human world. We have taken text from the Bible and we have used them to insult our humanity, to denigrate our humanity, and to cause human beings to be plastered with guilt and a sense of inadequacy. And somehow we think that if we can make people feel bad enough about themselves, that that will immediately translate into thinking how great God is, that God can love a wretch like you and me. No, I think we've got that all wrong. And when you get underneath the literal text of the Bible and begin to look at the Christ experience, what you discover is that the Christ experience calls people to step beyond the boundaries of their lives, to step beyond your tribal identity so that you can no longer say, if you aren't my people, you are my enemy. So you can no longer justify a preemptive strike against a nation that has not attacked you. You've got to get beyond tribal thinking. In America, we now sing God Bless America every time we can stand up. Sort of a response to 9-11, and I'm in favor of God blessing America, don't misunderstand. But that's a tribal song, and that song suggests that the blessing of God should be limited to the boundaries of my nation. There's a better way to sing that song. The prophet Malachi said, you really don't understand God until you understand that from the rising of the sun to its setting, embracing the whole world, the name of God shall be great among the Gentiles, and in every nation, incense shall be offered to God's name. Do you really think that human beings living in fierce tribal loyalties will not ultimately destroy themselves and the whole human enterprise? We don't need to be rescued. We need to be empowered to become more fully human. And that's the Christ function. And that's why I believe that people saw that in the life of this Jesus, the presence of God was operating in a way that they didn't know how to process. And since the only thing they understood about God was a distant force outside the world, they tried to explain their God experience of wholeness, of being called beyond the boundaries of tribe, beyond the killing prejudices of our humanity, beyond the gender games we play between men and women, and beyond the religious games that we use to set ourselves apart from other religious traditions. You've got to get called beyond all of those and the power of God to enter your life and to affirm you and to enable you to become something you've never been, a human being who is free to give your life and your love away. That becomes the place where we see God who was in Christ, and that's the place where we see God who is in you and God who is in me. And when the Christian church begins finally, not to insult your humanity, but to empower you to be fully human, then I think there will be a great reformation. You see, I don't believe that my responsibility as someone who lives inside the Christ story is to take my story and impose it on other people. I think my responsibility is to do everything I can do to enable everybody in this world to live more fully and to love more wastefully and to have the courage to be all that they can be apart from the defining and limiting definitions that we have imposed upon one another. And when we see that as our mission, then we have the basis for creating a human family, a human unity, beyond all of our barriers. And we can begin the task of accepting and loving people 
into the process of becoming all that they can be. That's my understanding of the Christian faith, and that's the divine love of God that I think we've got to get to after we have traveled beyond the terrible text of the Bible, the text of hatred to discover the God of love. Well, thank you very much for giving me your attention tonight. All right, the time is what? 9.30? So we have 15 minutes. Yeah, and, uh, I, I got 15 minutes. I, I'm probably in the best situation to respond to questions. So I'm, I'm going to hear from myself. Do. Yes. Um, well, let me just say to begin with that what spawned. Well, let, let me say before we start. Before I talked about having this, I ran it by you. Yep. I said, I want your yep. opinion. Yep. Before and every, everything in here was, was solid. But the, the only thing I'll say is he's talking about Western Christian tradition. The Western Church, the Catholic Church, went through Augustine. So um, the idea of the fall is not actually something that Judaism really deals. I mean, Judaism says, eh, it was bad, which, you know, but Judaism talks about the Genesis 1 and 2, particularly 2, terrible history. Terrible history in terms of it's just bad history because it's not meant to be history. But it's, that, Nancy. it's actually great theology because. Okay, here, here's contact information for Nancy Downer. Just, there's a mute all button on the bottom of that, that thing. Um, human beings were created to be responsible, responsible. But the first thing that happens is we make excuses, you know. When Adam says, uh, when, when God says to Adam, it's like, um, you're wearing some stuff that would be really uncomfortable. What's up with the fig leaves? <laughs> and, you know, Adam says, oh, no, it wasn't me. It was the woman that thou didst give me. <laughs> She's the one. You know, women are considered to be the weaker sex because they, you know, she ate the apple, Right. But she has this long conversation with the serpent, you know, and when Adam comes up, she says, oh, here, he says, well, okay. I mean, he just takes it ease. It's like, so which is, you know, which is weaker? But the thing is, in the Western church, the, the sense of fall is a disaster, okay? We are now in the mud. The car is, so look at it this way. It's like, okay, um, if you're in a car crash, how bad is the crash? I mean, is the windshield broken? Is, you know, have you lost your tires? You know, have you, you know, is your spark plug gone? All of that stuff. It's, if, if it's super, super bad, then you need something super, super big to save it. Like, what happens if you just, it's just out of alignment? You know, then you don't need something as dramatic. In the Western church, through Augustine, Human beings can't save themselves. They are stuck in the mud. And so what God is trying to do is God is trying to push this wretchedness out of the schmuck that we're in. The Eastern church says, that's wrong. The Orthodox church says, no. Human beings are not defined by sin. Human beings are defined by who they are in the life of God. And let's face it, you and I are not there fully right now. We're just not. But it's very different to say God is pulling us from the top to where we actually, to who we actually are. Spawn does it in terms of saying that's what full humanity is. But from the Easter tradition, it's like, you guys are freaking awesome. You're just not living like you are. We don't act like we are in the life of God. The theological foundation for that is the Trinity. And if you're interested in knowing the theological underpinning of how you get there theologically, next week will interest you. If not, you can sleep in. <laughs> um, but he's absolutely right in the Western church. You know, Abraham is, is asked, 
to sacrifice his son. And at the last minute, the angel comes in. He's got the binding of Isaac. You know, in Judaism, it's the Akadots. It's terrible. His child has been bound. And an angel comes in and stays Abraham's hand. But not Jesus. I mean, Carol was a school teacher, right? So the idea in Jude, I mean, in, in Western Christianity is you got 30 students in your class who are all terrible. <laughs> they're shooting spit wads across the room, they're pulling fire alarms, they're throwing food on the floor. You got 30 really bad, bad, bad kids. You got one kid that's perfect. So what do we do? We punish the one who's perfect. Makes a lot of sense. There is a lot of stuff within Christian um, theology about sacrificial theories of atonement. Um, Rudolf Boltmann said sacrificial theories of atonement are sub-moral. They're sub-moral. There's, there's just like, ugh, I have less than no use for sacrificial theories of atonement. You can explain the cross very different than it's a sacrifice that Jesus died for your sins. Jesus died for your sins in the same way that we participate in the sins of history. You know, in America today, we participate in the sins of slavery simply because we're living in a situation in a society where race tensions is still very, very real. It's very real in our world. So given that, that's a, just a background. So you don't actually have to embrace that view of the fall because the Eastern tradition doesn't. I never, I didn't discover the Eastern tradition until I got to my doctoral work actually in theology. So even in seminary, it's like, how come no one told me this before? So I have a lot to share on stuff like that. But do you have questions for what you saw? Because I could probably answer just about anything that he talked about. Nothing? First of all, I was still well, did it relate to you? Did you, was it meaningful to you? The presentation, Spong's, Spong's sermon. Was it thought provoking? Yes. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. very thought provoking. And by the way, this was put in the chat that I was raised Episcopalian, and I am very glad to see that this is an Episcopalian priest out there with these views. As they, he expressed many views that I have. So this is being recorded. And it will be available on our website. I'll send out an email when, when it, it'd be a couple of days. I don't know when exactly. So I will send an email when this is on our recording is on our website, so you can listen to it again if you want, or any portion of it if you want. Thank you, Jim. EJ, I just wondered. I've never heard this concept before or this approach before. How? I mean, is this a common thing among other churches other than I don't know anything about Eastern, so I, I, you know, I can't speak to that, but, you know, is this out there? Um, I'd say that a lot of uh, my colleagues would actually believe most of this stuff. It's just that as preachers, we don't often do it this directly because we actually like our jobs. <laughs> um, and, you know, we don't want to get thrown out on our ear. The, the difficulty is, um, and this is, in a, this is a matter of approach. So I have colleagues who say, okay, so the virgin birth, it's, it's a bunch of Huey and all of this other stuff, and we need to throw it all out. They take all of the mystery, everything out, and it's a very rational thing, and you lose... Um, you lose the power of the stories. And so for me, it's like, no, no, no. Don't just demythologize your, your, your stuff, but you, then you need to re-mythologize because it's, it's when you get inside the story. I don't care. I, I tell people, like, I've, I've told congregations on Easter, it's like, I don't care whether you believe this historical story of like Jesus is like, poof, you know, out of that. But there is truth in that story that unless you allow it within yourself, unless you let the story get inside of you, then the story can't heal in a way that our humanity is healed. Um, but yeah, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of my colleagues would absolutely believe all of this stuff. 
-hmm. So I, I'm, a, I'm a weird mix because I actually think that what the church said about Christ, like truly human, truly divine, um, is important because what that says is that humanity and divinity are not set, are not things that don't go together. They go together. What I would say, and I think what Small would say, he didn't, he didn't do this, but what the church says about Jesus is actually true about all of us. So if you get your Christology wrong, you get your anthropology wrong. If you don't fundamentally understand that humanity and divinity were created to be together, belong together, then you don't understand what being human means. And that's what Spong is getting at. We would get at it from different angles because I'm probably, well, I'm stranger probably, but uh, I would do it theologically because I was trained as a theologian, so. I'm really surprised that the Episcopal Church does embrace him. <laughs> well, he was a little bit of an outlier. Um, that he he was not universally beloved within all aspects of the <laughs> the church, but you know within circles he is he he had a very strong following. He was an important part of the. Uh, that progressive movement of re-examining the, the texts and saying, what does it mean? Um, but he operated out of Virginia and North Carolina. I think it was Southern Virginia, but I don't know. I'm not, I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, when I think of that area, I don't think of that as being progressive. Oh, no, no, but he was, he was progressive. <laughs> he is very but he, he spent his lifetime in that general area. Yeah, and and you know he was a voice that uh, um, you know cried out in the wilderness. He was he was a John the Baptist kind of preacher pastor. Other questions? Well, thank you very much. I will look more of him up. <laughs> there are other sermons on like um, would you be interested in hearing I, I, I haven't gone through and screened them I don't know the content but if I look for content would it be something that you might sure, be interested in yes. and, and those of you that are that are off site at home or wherever would you be motivated next time we do this to come in and be part of our group here in this building or, or, or um, that immaterial. I'm much more comfortable being at home. <laughs> uh -huh. Ron's it. getting ready to go through chemo treatments and, or not chemo, but radiation treatments. And I'm much more comfortable being at home and doing things from home. Sure. I still run into Ron on the strand. <laughs> he's out there walking every day. Yeah, he's good. He's good. Good. All right. Okay. Anything else? Wonderful. Thank you. We did already left, but anyway, I'm thankful that BJ was here and was able to participate. So uh, next Sunday, our topic, well, as you heard. BJ will be talking about the Trinity. I, I specifically asked him to do this because I have never understood the Trinity. Just, so, so that is our topic next Sunday. So thank, thank you for attending. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.